experience, getting too caught up in the race with other people. Uh, one of the beauties, one of the biggest pros and cons of CrossFit, you get so much diversity in one place. Yeah. Not just culture diversity, not just gender. You're talking about different levels of training in terms of training age. So someone who's come in, who's been doing it for three weeks, someone who's been doing it for six years, someone who's been doing it for one, two, everything is in that class. But people don't see that. Mm. And I just wish, I almost wish people had to wear a shirt that just had their training age on it. And it was like... <laughs> like the CrossFit thing. Yeah, like your it. six years is on the back of you. This is my eighth open. This is my, I have done zero opens. Yeah, Just so like when that. someone sees them and they go, oh, they're cleaning 110 in the workout. Oh, they've been doing it for six years. Not, yeah. I'm going to throw more weight on because they've got more weight on the bar. Yeah. Should I be cleaning 110 too? Because yeah. they are. And There's a bit this. more context. Yeah. Like, it's not as simple as, oh yeah, we're similar size. Like I should do what he does. It's like, he's been doing it for a very long time. Welcome back to the Unbound Podcast. Today's video is going to be about five common mistakes that people make starting CrossFit. If you can relate to one of these mistakes, comment down below your error during your first session of CrossFit. New people into CrossFit, it's like very similar to the Open. Coming from, let's say they go six months, they haven't really done anything, they come into training, and then they're doing five, six days a week, yeah. and they last six weeks, and then they're burnt out. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, they're just all in. And it, it is very much like that. It's very exciting. It's, it's a community. People are great to be around. You want to be here all the time. You find they finish work. The place they want to be is at the gym. Do you remember your first? Like, I was like that. Yeah, first month. But like how how addicting it was. Like yeah. you were just like, holy crap. It was it was one of the first times in my life where I was like, I fucking suck at this, but I just <laughs> want to keep doing it. Yeah. Um. It's it's weird. Like normally when you're really bad at something, you avoid it. Yeah. But for some reason, you just wanted to keep coming back. I felt like because. CrossFit also had those little snippets of little bits of light somewhere because it like shined on something that you were good at. Yeah. And there was always that little thing that you had that some other one, someone else didn't or the average person in the class that you were training and didn't have it. And you were just like, yeah, I'm better than everyone. It, and def then it definitely it adjusted the way I program based on that too because it yeah. gave you a little bit of what you wanted and then a little bit of what you needed. Yeah. And that's kind of how I program for clients where I'm like, okay, well, you're going to do things that you need to do yeah, and they're going to suck and they're going to be boring, but I will give you something that you like to do yeah, so that you go between the two. Yeah, exactly. And that way it's not like a dreaded session. It's like, um, we use the strategy for Mondays. Like you, for all the gyms out there, if you want to start people off to a really good week, program a clean workout on Mondays. Everyone loves cleans. Who Everyone love cleans? will turn up and they will probably train three to five times in the week. Yeah, because they're like, good. I got yeah. Monday down and like Monday was cool. What's Tuesday? Ah, shit. War balls. You know, running. Oh, God. But, you know, yesterday was pretty cool and I feel good. So I'm going to go to that one instead of just being like, hero workout Monday. Yeah. Ah, crap. What's the next day? Oh, it's Fran. Ah, shit. You know what I mean? Like, And it's like you might have snatch gear work on Wednesday, but because they got to do their cleans on Monday... They're like, okay, I'll come and I'll work on my snatches and I'll do some skill stuff. Yeah. And I mean, you could write the best program in the world, but if they aren't turning up, it's not doing shit. Yeah. If it's not fun, it's um, not going to keep people coming back as well. So it has to like have that little bit of like, like, like split down the middle where it's good for them and it's fun. Yeah. But like not every day needs to be fun, but Monday <clears throat> especially. And it's something you learn. Like I, I very much was like, you need this. Yeah. So I'm going to give it to you. Yeah. But then you're like, okay, well, am I really helping? Because they're not turning up. Yeah. <laughs> they might need it, but they're not They're not wanting it. You know yeah. what I mean? They're not wanting to come. So I guess like that's a good way to start. So well, what, was the, what was the first one? It was um, coming too often, too quickly. Going too hard, too fast. Yeah. So the full send mentality, both workouts and like training consistency just sheer volume yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's just like, insane um i mean the most common way you see this is run it's crossfit does tend to mimic that where it's like all right well i haven't done anything i'm getting off the couch and what do you hear i'm gonna go 5k run or yeah. i'm gonna run three or four days a week and it's like you're just gonna get hurt it's like you need to build your capacity back up yeah. um and that's kind of the conversation we have with our onboarding a lot of time with the onboarding it's like okay well how much have you been training and they're like oh nothing okay well two days this week two days next week and we'll go for three the following week and yeah. we'll see how your body recovers. Some people are really good. They can go straight into three days a week. Yeah. Others, not so good. <laughs> um, 
but that helps with retention. Yeah, exactly. They're not going to feel like they're just always <clears throat> sore and they're like, God, I can't even perform my job now. I yeah. can't even go to work and sit down because that just hurts so much. And it, it is case by case, but it is something that your coaches need to be aware of. Going too hard, too fast, mistake number one. What's mistake number two? Uh, let's have you do one. Okay. What's mistake number two? Ooh, oh, okay. Um, From a member perspective. Look, I'm going to say making too many financial <laughs> purchases when it comes to CrossFit, specifically around gear. I've, I've got one. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go. The, the speed rope does my head in. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> tying into double unders where it's like, I'm going to go pay $150 for a speed rope to learn double unders. It's like, like, I always <sighs> ask, does it have a motor on it? Is it skipping for yeah. you? Is there a man that comes out or a woman who starts skipping and spinning the rope for you? Because if you're paying $150 for a bloody skipping rope, like, I don't know what this thing does that's different to the 10 or 20 buck one you can just get. Well, there was a rule. We did a skipping seminar with some of the Australian skippers yeah. and they came down and ran us through triple unders, double unders, skill work and all that stuff. And they said, you need to use a $10 or less rope until you can hit 60 unbroken double unders then you can start shopping. There you go. And a lot of it, when you ask why, it's like you need the weight to build your forearm endurance yeah. and get more feedback on your rope. Yeah. Going straight to the lighter, faster ropes with the nice bearings, it's just not going to teach you anything. Exactly. Like, like a It's a shortcut and then it, you're going to struggle <laughs> in your workouts for repeat double unders yeah. and then you have to come back to a cheaper rope anyway. <laughs> or your rope will die. Most, most times that are like rather than not, is they'll buy the expensive rope and then they'll leave it here. <laughs> yeah. Someone else has an expensive rope for free. Thank you. It's always in the lost property. You'll see like the $150 RPM ropes. I suppose on that, the grips is maybe something that's a little different. It's a, it's a necessity, I think. Yeah, and, that's one where, okay, you could spend the money. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the rope is one where you shouldn't. Yeah, definitely. Like ropes, like knee sleeves are also a bit of a, a bit of an interesting one because a lot of people immediately won't be hitting rope climbs or lots of high volume lunge workouts where the knee sleeves can be very uh advantageous so it's like okay you've got these knee sleeves it's what are they for it becomes a comfort yeah oh they're for my knees what's wrong with your knees or oh, nothing it just makes me feel can't good squat without them yeah can't, can't, lunge without can't them, squat yeah. really so you sit on the toilet with knee sleeves like no oh well then you can squat without them it's yeah. just that that comfort's there um belts big one as well uh people rush to get the belt and like my method with a belt is like you know if it's if it's high volume over 85 percent chuck on a belt sure like yeah. get it's been proven that it can increase your performance you know improve your one rms etc but wearing a belt during a 40 kilo clean or snatch workout may not be it <laughs> may not be advisable yeah, if you're at that point there's something you're not doing. Yeah. Like you, you probably shouldn't be cleaning that bar. <laughs> like your, your back's flared or your <laughs> hips are jacked or that belt's not doing you any favors. Yeah. It's not like you break your arm yeah. and you just wrap something around it. And, and then like, it's, yeah, like, right. it's like, what you're doing it to burn the calories. Just sit on the bike. Yeah. Like, yeah. Just gear's always a big one. I always see too much people with too many, too many pieces of gear. Um, they've been doing CrossFit for three months and they've got more gear in their gym bag than I do. And I've nearly hit 10 years. So I'm like, yeah. mm, there's a bit of an issue there, like a bit of an expense issue. And I always like the, the double under one that you mentioned. I had a big W double under rope for nine years before I got like a $40 rope from Rogue. And that's only because I couldn't find my other rope. Yeah. So I, people just need the weight. Yeah. They need the weight to, to train and build endurance on. Cool. So we've got going too hard. <laughs> we've got spending too much. What's your next one? Uh, number three would be definitely loading, um, where it's just, it's not, it's getting too caught up in the race with other people. Uh, one of the beauties, one of the biggest pros and cons of CrossFit, you get so much diversity in one place, yeah. not just culture diversity, not just gender. You're talking about different levels of training in terms of training age. So someone who's come in, who's been doing it for three weeks, someone who's been doing it for six years, someone who's been doing it for one, two, everything is in that class. But people don't see that. Mm. And I just wish, I almost wish people had to wear a shirt that just had their training age on it. And it was like... <laughs> like the CrossFit thing. Yeah, like, your six years is on the back of you. This is my eighth open. This is my, I have done zero opens. Yeah, Just so like when that. someone sees them and they go, oh, they're cleaning 110 in the workout. 
oh, they've been doing it for six years. Yeah. Not, I'm going to throw more weight on because they've got more weight on the bar. Yeah. Should it's, I be cleaning 110 too? Because yeah. they are. And There's a bit more this. context. Like, yeah. It's not as simple as, oh, yeah, we're similar size. Like, I should do what he does. It's like, he's been doing it for a very long time. Yeah. Um, so that's probably the biggest thing. It's probably the most common one that everyone sees. People just throwing too much weight on too quick. You hear it with things like overhead squats and snatches. Oh, if I got more weight on the bar, it's easier. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, but that's a compensation. Yeah, exactly. So you still need to stay on that lighter bar and get comfortable with it. Yeah. And then and they, they're so hesitant to work on technique, which will inherently get them the heavier bar. Like if they want more weight, you just got to get a better technique. But they're like, well, if I just keep <clears throat> adding weight, then I'm going to get more weight. And it's like, eventually that's going to run out and your shit technique's going to come out. Mm-hmm. Like you're eventually going to get to a point on your snatch where your overhead position is just abysmal. And it's like, well, I can't get any more weight because my technique's now a limiter. You yeah. can't just keep adding weight. It's just not going to get you back on the empty bar with the coach. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and there's nothing worse. Like we get guys who they come in, they might be like, um, they think they're competitive and they're like, I want to book in a session with you. And then they come to a session and you don't get them off the 20 kilo bar <laughs> and you have to humble them because it's like, you skipped this process. Yeah. Like, you are going back and you are doing this again. <laughs> it's like the most demoralizing um, thing too. I Like Matt and I love nothing better than doing that with people. Yeah. Like where it's like, okay, we're going to pull you back a peg. Yeah. Um, and, and in two months you see massive progress after it. Exactly. Um, for some reason, just early on, whatever it is, whether it's ego, whether it's just getting caught up in everything, they just skip it. I, I think it's, yeah, I think it's a bit of a combination of like you said, <laughs> And, and it, it definitely happens more with men, very much so oh, with all men. All the time. Men, we, women, women are pretty humble when it comes to their weights. Like they actually, they will lift less than what they usually do. They undershoot, whereas men always overshoot. It's like... Yeah, so it's like one of the best expl- explanations I heard is is women do things to be competent. So I want to learn a rope climb to be able to do a rope climb. Yeah. Um, men do things to be competitive. So once we learn the rope climb, if the guy next to me can do two... I want to be able to do two, but faster than him. Yeah. Now he can do three. I want to do four. Yeah. Now he can, and so on. It as just keeps going. Yeah. Females don't care. No, they don't. Majority of them will be like, I can do a rope climb. So what? I don't care that she can do five. <laughs> and I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. And that's why we have more, I guess we make more mistakes. We do stupid things because. <laughs> that's why we die younger. <laughs> yeah. That is why we die younger. So we've got too much volume too quickly. We've got too much money spent on equipment. We just covered loading too heavy and unnecessary loading too heavy before you work on the basics. And well, actually, that was actually the one I was going to go into is the basics. Mastering the basics before going ahead. And that's kind of going to tie in with yours with the loading is the people who try and do 10 butterfly pull-ups but can't do a strict pull-up. Yeah. People who, you know, are, are looking to try and do a strict handstand but they've got three ab mats. It's like, there's an element of raw strength that you should be able to obtain or there should be a standard for most people. Say, for example, you need to do X amount of pull-ups, X amount of dips before you attempt a muscle-up. Yeah. And that's purely just for their safety as well as not just letting them spend half an hour kipping on the rig, getting nowhere because they don't have the inherent raw strength or that base level strength behind them. That also carries over in like, you know, Metcons, cardio, so there's, gymnastics. Yeah, there's a lot to that. And from like running this for a long time and seeing different coaches, um, the biggest thing you'll run into is people want to feel like they're included. Yeah. Um, there is a way that you can coach that well. Yeah. And you can allow them to basically just get a little bit of a taste for it, but still progress the skills. Yeah. So if you look at what you were just talking about, they want to, they're jumping straight into butterfly, but they're not developing their strict work you have that conversation with them and you go, we have two things we're going to progress. There's two dials. We're going to progress your strength dial and we're going to progress your skill dial yeah. and then we'll do the butterflies later on. So <clears throat> you say to them, you kind of bargain with them. You go, okay, we're going to do some kip and regrip stuff. All right, so we get to work on our gymnastic shapes. We get to work on our timing and we get to experience what it's like to do some kipping stuff. Yeah. Then we're going to do our bandage strict stuff as well. All right, so we're doing our bandage strict pull-ups. We're doing our dead hangs. We're doing our isometric holds. Um, I find that is your best way to, to, to coach them. Yeah. Otherwise, they'll just pull back. Yeah. So if, if you, you tell go, them no, they'll just be like, 
screw you, I'm still going to do it anyway. Yeah, it's almost meet them in the middle. Yeah. Um, and it's also not a bad way to then close that gap really quickly later on exactly. because they've already developed a lot of those positions and skills and timing. Yeah. So now being able to express that strength in something like a butterfly pull-up is just easier for them. Yeah. Um, and you can do that with the handstand. Like you might just be using it for time upside down. You might use the ab mats for slow eccentrics. Um, there's plenty of things that you could do. Yeah. You just need to be a bit creative as a coach and try and meet them halfway. Yeah. And also, I guess, have that confidence <coughs> and the ability to go up to someone and be like, hey, like, you doing 10 butterfly pull-ups without doing a regular pull-up, like that can hurt you. Like that that yeah, might not be the yeah, safest sure. thing to do. And just be like, yeah, look, and like you said, like meet them halfway. Be like, here's an option that we can run through to get the best of both worlds to get you to that point where this won't be dangerous. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess, because longevity, if they get injured, then pretty much there goes a member or there's at least a member at risk of leaving because they're like they don't feel included because... yeah it's a negative experience and you, and you don't want that no exactly so we've covered four out of five you've got the last one what is it um so this is probably a little bit later on but if what i find is a most common mistake is tracking the wrong metrics yeah and what i mean by that is like what people tend to go for is they go, they sometimes get too caught up with bigger sets or they get too caught up with like holding on for too long and they just extend their rest breaks by default. Yeah. That is a specific way of training. But then what they miss is they miss the other side of training, which is the density work. So yeah. if we were taking someone from snatching and we were doing 80% work and we're giving them 90 second rest between each rep and then we bring them down to EMOMs, all right, to try and work on density. There's a spe that's a specific way of training and, and programming for them. Yeah. What we tend to find in the classes is people will try and go, well, I did seven, I want to do eight. But by default, they just extend their rest break now. Yeah. And then they wonder why they're not fit enough tying into the open for things like the open. Yeah. All right. As where what they could have done is gone, okay, well, I have a set of 30 pull-ups. I'm going to do them as 10 sets of three and I'm only allowed three seconds rest. Yeah. All right. It's probably going to be hard, but hard in a different way. Yeah. All right. So you're making it more aerobic. They're not probably going to run into that grip endurance issue. They're probably not going to run into any strength limiters. And I feel like that's a type of training that most people miss. Yeah. They ignore it completely. Um, that could benefit a lot of people. So a lot of the time when I'm trying to get clients fitter, that's what I'll talk to them about. I'll say, hey, we need to make these denser. We just need you to do smaller sets do them quicker, rest less. Yeah. All right. So it's not, oh, I did 10 pull-ups. I got the chalk ball. There's 35 seconds. <laughs> it's three, drop, one, two, three, three, drop, one, two, three. Yeah. Um, at a certain level, you can give them, there's a couple of strategies. If you're someone who likes numbers like myself, um, you might go one to two. So for every rep, you get two seconds. Yeah. All right. Or you can move them even depending on the movement, something like a burpee. You might go, all right, for every rep, you get one second rest. Yeah. Um, so you can put that into the programming or use that as a coaching tool. Yeah. Um, and I find that helps a lot. It just creates enough variance for them to get the adaptation that they weren't getting before. Yeah, exactly. And, and even on the, uh, the, the density and how you're mentioning, like it might be more effective for someone to do three sets of 10 versus 30, like pull ups unbroken. The, the classic fives on the toaster bar has always been a great one for me in workouts that have a toaster bar that extend over 15. So 15 or more, doing sets of five has always been more beneficial than doing 15 unbroken. Especially if there's repeat sets and you're going back up, your grip is going to fatigue. Yeah. Like you, you ever, if any, if anyone don't doesn't believe me, like watch 15.1, watch Matt Fraser do like you, like, you, like what, what is it like uh, over under hand grip for toaster bar the alternating group he's yeah. he's gone he's lost it he went too hard out the gate yes this is old school matt fraser not matt fraser at his peak but the same thing still applies like these top dudes were doing sets of three because they went way too hard too quickly and they weren't able to maintain the density and the volume of toaster bar that was required so um having those smaller sets and having the shorter breaks genuinely is more efficient in the shorter to longer workouts uh, then just sending it, touch and going all your reps and having like a 40 to 50 second vacation before you get to the next movement. Well, it's like by default, what happens? You run out of the ability to take time away. Yeah. So you do bigger sets. 
So your your ability to tolerate bigger sets generally will go up anyway. Yeah, exactly. Because um, you're you're doing more with less rest. It's yeah. just it it makes sense. You're just compounding your interest on improving your volume. Like you're just getting you be able to do four reps every x amount of seconds. Then you can do five reps the next week. Then six reps, and your bigger sets will just. Feel and you're see, you're seeing it come up a lot more in in programming now, where it's like, all right, you're doing five toes by every twenty seconds, or. Yeah, where people are actually taking the numbers from the guys at the high level, there's enough data there that you can literally just work out. Okay, you have to be able to hold three second burpees. You have to be able to hold a uh, one point eight second wall ball. Yeah, and you can write that into programming. Yeah, and then it just gives it. It makes it easier for those people who are looking at getting to that next level who just feel like that they need to go unbroken on everything to keep up with the big dogs. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> which you don't. You actually don't. Um, break early, break often has always been a a great phrase of mine and it just makes sense yeah you just get used to being fitter like just moving consistently eliminate yeah. i mean for the open the easiest tip is just eliminate your rest breaks yeah exactly like transitions what pace can you move where you don't rest yeah and and, and just do that maintain it the whole yeah. workout so there were five things five common errors that people generally struggle at when they start crossfit or they've been doing crossfit for a long period of time there's about 45 more <laughs> part two next yeah. time cross yeah crossfit is very good at making mistakes we just need to get better at learning from them. as crossfitters we are bad at making mistakes be sure to make your mistakes your questions and comment them down below for the next unbound podcast thanks for listening